and just have fun with our alliance band. Uh, Dan Barellis on bass, Yay. Craig Highfield on the mandolin. Um, I'm Al Todd from the Alliance, and we have our friend Jeff Holland, the West Road Riverkeeper, Yay. joining us tonight. So, and actually, we're going to start out with one of with Jeff's song here. He'll explain. Yes. Night, night yeah. Night. No. 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 Yeah. Work. Good work. Um, okay. Let's see if we can get this tightened up. So I guess that's the question. How many people in this room have a pocket tool on their belt? Uh, <laughs> I should have been on the demographic right. survey. <laughs> that should have been on there. Right. Also, uh, how many pairs of boots do you have in your car at all times? <laughs> do you carry your fishing rod with you at all times? <laughs> so this is a song that was inspired by one of my first uh, meetings of one of these, uh, one of these groups where I was just astonished by all of the acronyms. And I just thought the BMPs and the TMDLs and, the, and I thought if I could only have a periodic table with all of the interpretations of all of the key players. Uh, so this is about SAV. And when I heard that phrase, subaquatic vegetation, I knew there was music there. And what kind of music would it be but a tango? <laughs> the baby boomer generation has fostered overpopulation, waterfront property inflation, development deforestation. Deforestation leads to soil erosion that wreaks environmental devastation on subaquatic vegetation. I neglected to mention that this is a sing-along. That's right. This is your part. So let's divide the ship's company into two watches, and everybody over on this side of the auditorium sing with me, S-A-V, like this. S-A-V, 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 S-A-V. Why don't you keep that up now? Right, now you're going to join me, right? S-A-V. Subaquatic vegetation. S-A-V. Subaquatic vegetation. S-A-V. Subaquatic vegetation. S-A. All together now with feeling. S-A-V. Subaquatic vegetation. S-A-V. Subaquatic vegetation. S-A-V. Subaquatic vegetation. S-A-V. Subaquatic vegetation. You comprehend the complications. Erosion brings about siltation, which covers up the vegetation, creating sunlight deprivation. Muddies the water till the plants must desist. Their photosynthesis, yet it's a cause for consternation. For subaquatic vegetation, everybody now. S-A-V. Subaquatic vegetation. S-A-V. Subaquatic vegetation. S-A-V. Subaquatic vegetation. S-A-V. Subaquatic vegetation. Now listen for your information. It's not a hopeless situation. We must act without hesitation. Enforcing soil conservation. Instead of tearing down our trees, we must needs plant some seeds. The subaquatic vegetation can be saved by reforestation. Everybody now. S-A-V. Subaquatic vegetation. S-A-V. Subaquatic vegetation. S-A-V. Subaquatic vegetation. S-A-V. Subaquatic vegetation. It's not a tricky operation. Engaging in reforestation. Just make a little excavation and stick a sprout of vegetation in. Planting a little tree can be the solution to runoff pollution. It can be the one salvation for subaquatic vegetation. SAV. Subaquatic vegetation. SAV. Subaquatic vegetation. SAV. Subaquatic vegetation. SAV. One more time with feeling. SAV. Subaquatic vegetation. SAV. Subaquatic vegetation. SAV. Subaquatic vegetation. SAV. Subaquatic vegetation. Let's hear renovation for subaquatic vegetation. 
Thank you. Thank you. Good job, guys. Jeff Holland. All right. All right, and then we're going to do our, uh, what's become our little theme song for this. So we're going to do Tom Wisner's uh, classic, uh, Chesapeake Born. So some of you know that, some of you may not. Uh, but it's also kind of a call and response. There's the words, so you shouldn't have any trouble. Um, so it goes like this, essentially. It goes, Chesapeake born, Chesapeake born, Chesapeake free, Chesapeake free, Chesapeake bound, Chesapeake bound, flowing with ease, flowing with ease, Chesapeake born, Chesapeake born, bound to thee, bound to thee, indeed I am, indeed I am, Chesapeake free, Chesapeake free. Cause she's the mother of the waters and the people of this land. Forty river children try to take her by the hand. Flows through Maryland, through Virginia to the sea. She's Atlantic born and Atlantic bound and free. And she's Chesapeake born, Chesapeake born, Chesapeake free, Chesapeake free, Chesapeake bound, Chesapeake bound, flowing with ease, flowing with ease, Chesapeake born, Chesapeake born, bound to thee, bound to thee, indeed I am, indeed I am. Chesapeake free, Chesapeake free. Well, I'm the son of the rain and the brother of the wind. Follow on the water, I've got tobacco on my chin. I've seen 40 day years of wind and rain. And if I had it to do all over, I'd do it again. Cause I'm Chesapeake born, Chesapeake born, Chesapeake free, Chesapeake free, Chesapeake bound, Chesapeake bound. I'm flowing with ease, flowing with ease. Chesapeake born, Chesapeake born, bound to thee, bound to thee. Indeed I am, indeed I am. Chesapeake free, Chesapeake free. Indeed I am, indeed I am. Chesapeake free. And we're going to turn this over to our mandolin player here, Craig Highfield. So. Clayton, you mind turning the uh, podium mic on? I'll just use this one. All right, so this is actually the, the fifth year that we had the Forest Champion competition. Has anyone seen all five, including this one? Anyone been here that long? Excellent. So this is the fifth year doing it. This is the first year I get to be the MC of it. So kind of feeling kind of proud. I'm going to take a moment. Enjoy this. So I prepared a little something before we call people up. Trees. How about them? It's really all I got. So, and, and the reason is, I mean, I guess this would be the perfect time for me to, to throw up some facts and figures at you. Or maybe put up a pie chart about how great forests are for the bay. But this is the Chesapeake Watershed Forum. You should know that. You probably already do that. So rather than do that, what I'm going to do is I'm going to have you raise your hand here. Raise your hand if, through your work, a tree has gone in the ground. Raise your hand if, through your work, a tree has gone in the ground. Raise your hand if, through your work, a tree or a forest was protected. Raise your hand if, through your work, uh, forest health was improved or rejuvenated. Raise your hand if, through your work, 
a resident of the Chesapeake Bay watershed left a conversation with you knowing a little bit more about trees. See, this is really essential what we're doing. There's no need to do it. Now, part of me that I, I feel the pressure right now to throw up that pie chart, get into why that's important, but you already know that. And th the reason is, and I have my theory here, it's not important because the trees are so important. It's because we are forest people. If you live in the east, there's just something about being here that you're drawn to forest. I think we as part of our brain. And let me just think about it. I'm sitting in this room, he feels pretty comfortable in this room right now, kind of relaxed, looking around. Now imagine if this, this building was all metal and maybe like the plastic made out of the recycled Coke bottles. How would you feel? He's probably be getting a little antsy. There might be a brawl happening right over here. You don't know why, but it just happens. But it's wood, so we're calm. And I want to think about it later, too. This is how I know we're forced people. It's going to take one of you to start a bonfire out there. Just to start. You don't have to tell anyone about it. Eventually, you forced people are going to, for some reason, you're going to want to go over there and start hanging by this fire. For, you, I don't know why. It's your eyes. You want to see that heat and that ambiance produced by our forests. Maybe at this bonfire, you may commiserate with other forest people. And you may bring a libation, an adult beverage. Chances are, some of those adult beverages got its flavor from being stored in a white oak barrel. <laughs> Bourbon, wine, rum. We can thank our forest. And maybe as that conversation lulls, maybe someone might bust out a guitar. Maybe Al Todd might bust out his guitar made with an Appalachian red spruce top and maple back and sides, echoing the tones of our forest. And then maybe some of you might enjoy yourself a little too much and find yourself in the wee hours of the morning being awakened by the lonesome call of a whippoorwill out in these woods. So I, I tell you now that tonight, the festivities of tonight, is sponsored by our forests. So we as forest people are here to celebrate some forest champions. So this is a great, I think this is one of my favorite part of my jobs is putting together this awards program with countless support from a variety of people and forest year agencies, but through US Forest Service funding as well. Um, so we're great to happen to recognize some great effort that's going on in here. So uh, tonight's all about that, awarding this. So I'm gonna call up uh, each of our award D's and I tell, tell you a little bit about them. So we're going to start with the category at most effective at engaging the public because we feel that's a very important thing to try to bring these people in. And uh, can I have uh, Carl and Ann Little come up, please? Okay, you guys can stand right there and just let me swamp you with this. Uh, Carl and Ann Little essentially started Tree Fredericksburg. If you've heard of that, if you've read the Bay Journal recently, there's a nice little article about this. Uh, Tree Fredericksburg is a nonprofit organization dedicated to restoring and maintaining a vibrant urban forest in the city of Fredericksburg. Tree Fredericksburg educates and trains volunteers of all ages on bare root large caliper trees, mulching, uh, structural pruning, and proper planting techniques. They also have heavily involved in the utility tree replacement, provide information on tree selection and clearance criteria on their website. Through their partnership uh, with the City of Fredericksburg and other nonprofits group, Tree Fredericksburg planted over 721 trees in 2014 and 3,893 trees since only 2007. 4,500 now, adding in more years, excellent. And the great thing they're doing about this and why we have them as winning, uh, engaging the public, you would think they'd be on the ground stuff, is they've done this largely with volunteers in the Cedric Fredericksburg, just to get more uh, canopy trees in the, the beautiful uh, town of Fredericksburg. Each tree that is planted is cared for during the first two years after its planting. So it's not planting and walking away. So let's give a round of applause uh, to Carl and Ann Little.
And they actually can't stay tomorrow. They actually have a tree planting that they're doing. So dedicated. Okay, our next award winner is for the greatest on the ground impact. And I think they came from the furthest today. Uh, this is a partnership up in Bradford County, Pennsylvania. Anybody know it? It's where the Susquehanna's tiny up there. So if they can come on up, up, we'll have Kathy Yako of Bradford County Conservation District, Mike Hanawalt of the uh, NRCS in Bradford County, and Jen Johns of Chesapeake Bay Foundation's Pennsylvania office. Excellent. All right, so this actually obviously is a partnership, and a lot of this work of getting stuff done, it takes partners to do it. Uh, these three individuals represent a group of conservation partners in Bradford County, Pennsylvania, working on a broad and sustained effort to promote the implement riparian forest buffers throughout the county. Uh, through countless hours, workshops, outreach, mailings, farm visits, and strategic integration of buffers with other programs, these individuals and their groups uh, and other organizations have successfully implemented 3,149 acres of crep buff forested buffers under 450 contracts. It's a lot of acreage, a lot of forested buffers. And I tell you what, they're doing this very far from the bay too. So this is pretty awesome. Uh, this level of success in the, uh, at the county level is unparalleled in Pennsylvania and arguably in the entire bay region. Uh, the group of conservation partners, um, have successfully tapped into existing resources while seeking additional funds from many federal, state, and local grants. So I'd like to give you a round of applause for the Bradford County Partnership. Our next category, uh, hello, all right, exemplary forest steward. I like to call up Fred and Christine Andrie. Come on up. <laughs> Until they get on stage. Okay, Fred and, and Christine and Drie actively manage 790 acres of land under six separate forest stewardship plans. Their properties, which are protected under conservation easement, are located in the overall area that extends into both Warren County and Page County in Virginia. Anyone know that area? All right, very nice. Um, their accomplishments on their land include seven warm season grass that burns for wildlife habitat, hardwood riparian plantings, the establishment of wildflower, uh, wildflower areas, establishment and maintenance of 2,200 feet of trails accessible uh, to the public, a salvage harvest of storm damage and beetle-killed pines, and sustainable harvest of hardwood and pine on their working lands. Uh, in addition, Fred and Christine purchased multiple pieces of adjoining properties to protect a wildlife corridor uh, between George Washington National Forest and Shenandoah Park. So two very large forested tracks on each side of the valley. They're connecting it for wildlife. So a lot of wildlife has a lot of thanks for uh, these two individuals. So they're tirelessly working on their own land for the benefits, really, of everyone else, too. So I'd like to give a very big round of applause for our exemplary forest stewards, Fred and Christine Andrea. This one is, is not given every, every year. Uh, we generally don't do nominations for us, but it's recognizing someone who's committed really a lifetime uh, to the forest. So I'm going to call up Don Alton here. Uh, 
I'm going to give you a little, quick little story about how I met Don and why I think that he deserves this. I started my program, Force for the Bay, about eight years ago. And, you know, it's kind of new to forestry issues. And the first I got in there, I was ready to hit the woods and talk to some foresters about this. But uh, people in Maryland and elsewhere, they said, you got to go sit with Don Alton and talk with him a little bit. I was like, Don Alton? Then they said, yeah, he's a planner. A planner? I want to talk to a forester. What's a planner know about all of this? So I drive up to Towson, Maryland with all these buildings. I go into his office. At the time, I really think it was a glorified broom closet. There's no windows in the place. And here's this guy sitting with a bow tie at his desk. It's like, really? But I sat down with him, and we just chatted for the longest time. And I left just being blown away about really what is accomplished on the land. And it just doesn't take forestry people. It takes a lot of people with, with a lot of thinking on there. So uh, let me tell you a little bit about Don. Uh, Don has 42 years of experience in land uh, use planning and environmental management in Maryland, with experience on working on ca uh, county, regional, state, and national level levels. Uh, for the past 28 years, uh, Don has worked with the Baltimore County Department of Environmental Planning and Sustainability, where he led the development in the implementation of the county's forest sustainability program. While there, he also led the development and implementation of Baltimore County's renowned stream buffer and forest conservation regulations. That's why there's a lot of forest left up in there, a lot of great healthy forest. Uh, under Don's leadership, Baltimore has become one of only three counties in the entire country to actually implement and apply the Montreal process criteria of indicators. Uh, it's a framework for sustainability. If you've never heard of Montreal the, uh, process, this is something entire countries adopt. Canada has do adopted this to make sure their forests are sustainable. Chile has, Uruguay has, and Baltimore County has, which is pretty remarkable. <laughs> Uh, he has taken the, what I think is really remarkable too is really how he treats the public lands in Baltimore County, the parks up through there, these public forests. And I saw a quote on their website uh, saying, it was really taken from a benign neglect into forest sustainable management. So it's a different way of seeing the parks kind of as a resource that needs to be managed to bring the health and vigor back. And he's done some great things on the parks within Baltimore County and things that normally would seem controversial, especially these parks that are publicly used. Things like timber stand improvement, thinning out the forest, cutting down trees, uh, invasive plant control, deer herd management, now, imagine trying to explain to your superiors that in your public parks, you're going to cut down trees, kill plants, and shoot deer for the public good. That takes a lot of convincing to do, not only to that, but for the residents of Baltimore County who might use it to walk around. So it takes a long work, and they're, he's convinced a lot of people that's the right thing to do is to start bringing back the health of the forest. Uh, on private lands, he's kicked off innovative programs, uh, turf to trees to reforest suburban lawns, uh, reforestation of street trees and urban plantings, uh, the big trees sale, which he's selling large canopy type trees uh, to private residents, uh, and the newest, the Pretty Boy Watershed Collective. Uh, Don is in the core group member of the National Sustainable Forest uh, Roundtable and the inaugural member of the Maryland Sustainable Forestry Council, where he helped develop the state's recommendation for no net forest loss. So it is my indeed honor to offer the Lifetime Achievement Award uh, to Don Allen. <laughs> Uh, so Don would like, as an honorary member, he'd like to say a few words. All right, I won't take a long time. Thank you all so much. Uh, this was a, certainly a complete surprise, and the main thing I need to say is, you guys really know how to make somebody feel old. <laughs> but I do want to thank all of my friends and colleagues at the Alliance U.S. Forest Service for this award and uh, my ticket to retirement. Might as well go out when you're on top, right? No, I'm not done. Um, but I'm standing here really because there have been a tremendous number of people who have been behind me, working with me over the years. 
And I first want to say a big thank you to my wonderful wife, Janice, of 41 years, um, not only for putting up with my not only for putting up with my work habits, but also being a key part of the transition of our county from the old Clean Water Act 208 program, anybody remember that one, um, to what we are today. And I think that's one of the reasons why our county is out there and, and pretty progressive. So, you know, Forest Conservation Act, non-tidal wetlands, uh, the stream buffer protection, all those things were just the beginning for us and we've transitioned on. Um, again, work with a, a great number of people in Maryland DNR, Forest Service, U.S. Forest Service, the Alliance, other organizations, citizen groups such as the Pretty Boy Watershed Alliance, uh, our consultants, Len Rabel and uh, Steve Allgaier here came all the way up here tonight for this. Um, so really appreciate uh, the work behind um, all the work that we've been doing. And one final um, expression of thanks, I want to go out to Ruth McWilliams, of the U.S. Forest Service who first introduced us to this uh, linking communities to the Montreal Process Criteria and Indicators Project. Yeah, it's been a, an interesting journey. I hope that other organizations are, are able to look into going down the same path and realize how important forests are for everything that we're working for in the Chesapeake. Thank you again very much. Thank you. Good job. Please. Hey, Clayton, you mind turning on the um, mic on the podium? Thanks. So um, thanks, everybody, for coming out tonight. I know Jamie Baxter's in the audience. Uh, sorry, Jamie. He wanted me to do this in the, in the cafeteria or the dining hall, and I just I had to make you slog back over here. So I apologize, but I think it just sets up a little better for what we've got for you tonight. Um, so in introducing our keynote tonight, I was um, as you guys know, I'm not wanting for wanting to be up here in front and talking. I like to do stuff in the sides and do all that kind of stuff. <laughs> so um, I thought, who can I get to do this? And I thought, well, I, I got to do this one. So um, in thinking about our keynote, Ricky Arnold, you can read his bio in there. I'm not going to give you that. He is a local, local person, um, Bowie, Maryland born, taught school in, down in St. Mary's County, or Charles County, forgive me and then um, overseas for a good bit and onward and upward. But I wanted to kind of capture what was, what kind of, what comes to mind when I think about Ricky. We've been friends for a while. Um, and I go back to my environmental education days. I was an environmental educator before I started working for the Alliance. And I used to call on the, the book, Everything I Needed to Know, I learned in kindergarten. And I'm sure you're all familiar with all of those little tenets in there. Um, be nice, clean up after yourself. Uh, I can't remember all the others, but the one that always struck me as most important is to be aware of wonder. And I used to impress upon the young folks that I was teaching that that's the most important thing you can do. And I think from my perspective, that's what Ricky does every day. And I think that kind of shows how far you can get. I mean, we've spent, we've taken a lot of trips. Um, or paddling a canoe in Port Tobacco River, um, hiking the mountains out in Montana and Idaho, um, dry tortugas, lots of things. He's taken it one step further in this wanderlust world that we love, but um, it just, it's impressed upon me when you have that spirit of wonder, what you can do with it. And so with that, I'm gonna introduce Ricky Arnold, Mission Specialist, NASA. Um, thank you for coming out. And all yours. Yeah, I don't have the song though. Thanks. Um, yeah. Do we get this one going? Yeah, sounds like it. Good evening. Thanks uh, so much. Thank you, Lou. Um, it's it's great to be here uh, back home. It's great to be with with you folks this evening and um, submerged aquatic vegetation. That was what I did my master's thesis on over at Horn Point. And as I sat there listening to the song, I was thinking maybe if I would have sat that, set that thesis to song, 
I might have been asked back to get a PhD. <laughs> but uh, that didn't happen. Um, on behalf of all the, uh, the people at NASA that live in the Chesapeake watershed, and there are a lot of us. Uh, there's the folks who work at NASA headquarters in Washington, D.C. There's thousands of people who work at Goddard Space Flight Center in Greenbelt, Maryland. Down in Norfolk, Lang Langley Research Center, the Space Telescope Institute in Baltimore. And I guess I can even lump wallops, even though they're not technically, technically in the drainage. Um, they're on Delmar Delmarva, so we still love them. Thank you so much for, for all you do. Uh, on a daily basis. Uh, congratulations to, to all the award winners. That's a really impressive uh, list of accomplishments and just a, a, a real testimony to what service to your community uh, can, can accomplish. So congratulations. I, I am here um, to, to try to make a connection between what NASA does uh, every day and, and what you guys do every day. And I don't think it's really all that hard. I, I've had the advantage of um, living under the sea for 10, 12 days and also going around the Earth every 90 minutes on orbit, uh, 240 miles up. And uh, we live on an amazingly complex and beautiful planet. And what I was hoping to do is share a little bit of context or put Earth in a context for you uh, with our neighbors and then come back and just share some observations uh, as best I can um, with you about my time looking at this uh, amazing planet that, that we live on. And I've had all kinds of difficulty advancing the slides. So it should be really entertaining um, to watch me try to maneuver through this and wonder that the government trusts me to fly high-speed aircraft when I cannot <laughs> quite manage. So here's, here's where I was born and raised, and maybe most of you. It's just a, this is a great shot. And uh, I don't know, I was working on console one day, and a friend of mine, Suichi Noguchi, was on orbit. And I sent him a message, just sent him an email. I was working in Mission Control, so I sent him an email and said, hey, you, looks like you're going to fly over Maryland. Could you mind grabbing me a picture? And this came down like two hours later. It's like, I got a pretty cool job. <laughs> um, but just an amazing day uh, over a, a clear winter day. I remember it was like in February. Uh, it just reminded me of how uh, beautiful it can be here at home. This uh, photograph was taken on Christmas Eve in 1968 by a gentleman named Bill Anders uh, on Apollo 8. This was an amazing mission. Uh, the, the CIA had convinced NASA that the Russians were launching out there, uh, moving their big lunar rocket out to launch. And uh, the NASA was afraid that we were going to lose the race to the moon to the Soviet Union. So NASA actually launched three guys to the moon and a rocket that really hadn't been tested to come back with no lunar lander capability. Um, I don't know if you remember, if you've seen this in movies or on TV, but this was Christmas Eve. They came around, the crew read for, from Genesis, but this was probably the most famous picture taken uh, last century, or certainly one of them. And I think it sh shaped our view of our home planet in incredibly. Um, this was taken in 1968. We celebrate our first Earth Day on April 22, 1970. The EPA was established in December of 1970, and the Clean Water Act was established in, in 1972. And, and I think just having this uh, view of, of our Earth out there in the darkness of space with another planet as the foreground or our moon as the foreground kind of fundamentally changed the way we, we view our planet. And I think this perspective, when John Kennedy, he never got to see this picture taken, uh, sadly, but um, when he talked about, about our place in the solar system, he said our most basic common link is that we all inhabit this planet. We all breathe the same air. We all cherish our children's future. And we're all mortal. So what I would like to do, and this is with a huge caveat, I am not a planetary scientist. I'm by training. Um, my background is in submerged aquatic vegetation. <laughs> if I was to say that at Johnson Space Center, we use acronyms all the time. Every day there's acronyms. Yeah, what's, what's that even mean? I use acronyms at work. I don't even know what they mean. <laughs> but if I was to say the words SAV, uh, I'd get a no sale sign. So this, the first part of this presentation comes with a caveat that I am not a planetary scientist. So if you happen to hear Neil deGrasse Tyson or Chris McKay or even the guys on the Big Bang Theory contradict something I say, this is just me being a science nerd, uh, sharing some of the, most, the latest discoveries about our solar system with you, and then I'll talk a little bit about looking at Earth. 
So by my count, there are now there are 17 robotic missions uh, going on in our solar system, extending fairly close to Earth, all the way out to the heliopause, which is the far reaches of our solar system. And additionally, there are six folks living up on the International Space Station, two of which are going to be up there. For, they're about halfway through their, their one-year mission. And this is our closest planet to the sun, Mercury. It, uh, it looks a lot like the moon. In fact, we kind of thought it was a lot like the moon. Um, Mercury Messenger just finished its mission in April after 11 years, and we finally flew it into Mercury, because when you crash something into another planet and the dust is kicked up, you can use a, spectrop a spectroscope to kind of get an idea of what what's the planet's composed of. This is a really hard planet for us to see from Earth because it's so close to the sun, but it is visible if you go out right before sunrise, sunset, near the coast where it's nice and flat with a pair of binoculars. It is uh, completely visible. It's uh, the smallest, the densest. It has the oldest surface, has the largest variations in uh, surface temperature, and it's also the least explored. And it's somewhere between the size of Moon and Mars. It has an atmosphere which is mostly oxygen and sodium, and the way this atmosphere, it's very thin, it's trace atmosphere, the way it forms is because solar wind, form of radiation coming from the sun, impacts the soil and releases the, uh, these gases from, from the sediment. It lost what early atmosphere it had out into space, and that's kind of a common theme. You'll hear the same thing when I talk about Mars. It just wasn't big enough to hold on to it. It has a pretty big iron core. Um, but it has a really weak magnetic field. The way it gets its magnetic field, it has a big chunk of iron and you're dragging it through an electric field which generates a magnet. We've, we've all done that in seventh grade science. And that's really important because the magnetic field is what protects any living thing from the radi radiation on, uh, coming from the, from the sun, which is uh, lethal to humans. No evidence of plate tectonics. But what's really interesting is in the impact craters on both poles, we found uh, substantial amounts of water, at least frozen water, and on top of that, a layer of kind of goo, which are kind of prebiotic chemicals. And one of the theories we have about how life originated on, on Earth and, and perhaps in other places is these chemicals, these organic chemicals, were caused by impacts of comets. So our recent studies of, of uh, Mercury have led credence to the fact that, hey, you know, maybe, maybe life on Earth, what part of that process was the impact of comets or an asteroid carrying prebiotic chemicals. This is Venus, clearly visible in the night sky. It's usually one of the brightest objects up there. And uh, we used to think of it as Earth twin. It's completely clouded, uh, covered in this cloud haze. Um, it's really not Earth's twin. Uh, those clouds are largely made of sulfuric acid. Uh, it's a pretty nasty place. It has weird atmospheric chemistry, mostly carbon dioxide. It suffers from runaway greenhouse um, gas. It's one of the most dense atmospheres in the solar system, for at least for the, uh, the, the terrestrial planets. Its atmosphere is 90, ti 90 times denser than that of Earth. It's over 800 degrees at the surface. And the atmosphere spins around the planet about every four Earth days. It is a nasty looking place. And the Russians have been flying there for a long time. This is the Venera probe. This picture is from the early 70s. And the, the atmospheric pressure is so strong and the atmosphere is so bad that the, and the heat so bad that the longest one of these probes has lasted was about two hours. This one only lasted, uh, or and the shortest was about 20 minutes. You can tell it kind of looks like a lava field. And, uh, but it's really hard for us to get a view of what's going on. So we sent a probe there to do some radar mapping. And this is kind of the, uh, the, the nasty landscape we saw. You can see you know, kind of uh, volcanic activity, lots of lava flows, lava domes. Um, and the crust shows no impact craters. So it's just a surface that just formed in a maelstrom and, and cooled uh, very rapidly. And um, no evidence of plate tectonics, no magnetic field. It's a really ho hostile, nasty environment. And we really still need you know, to learn a lot about this planet. Now, this place is fascinating. This is Mars. This here is Olympus Mons, uh, the largest volcano in the solar system. It's three times higher than Mount McKinley. It is so big, it's like the size of uh, New Mexico. And if you were standing on top of it, you would not even know that you were on top of a volcano because the lava flows coming out of it were, were, uh, were so gradual. Um, 
the, the amazing thing, too, is it, it probably hasn't uh, been active in a couple million years. This is an image of Mars as a very thin, uh, like 10% of the Earth's atmosphere, or less actually like 1%, but a very thin atmosphere, um, lots of impact craters, and a mountainous terrain. But its atmosphere is fascinating. Anyone know what this is? It's a dust devil on the surface of Mars taken, taken from orbit. River drainage systems from when water used to flow on the surface. And then down on the surface where we have had uh, rovers, we still have one active rover and a science uh, laboratory. I mean, it has a very Earth-like atmosphere. This looks like places I've visited in the desert southwest. Oh, there's, there's what I was warning you about. And this is actually a dust devil on the surface of Mars taken uh, within the past couple of years. And that's sunset on Mars. Absolutely fascinating place. But what we've really been learning, I understand, I just saw on my way up here today that NASA's getting ready to make another big announcement on Monday about something we've learned about Mars. And uh, there's been some conjecture uh, about our understanding of water and maybe that they might have found, rather than trace or traces of water or evidence of flowing water, that they might have actually found some water. This is an opaline deposit. And what's fascinating about that is that is evidence of a hydrothermal vent uh, occurring at one point in history. Hydrothermal vents on Earth are fascinating oceanographers because they're a completely different way of generating energy through chemosynthesis as opposed to photosynthesis. So the question we can't help but ask ourselves is, hey, Mars has all the stuff life needs. That's carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, phosphorus, sulfur. And we had hydrothermal vents are places where life has demonstrated its ability to, car to carry on and, and make energy. This is an ancient stream bed with small pebbles showing evidence of water flow. Conglomerates, just sedimentary rock formed by, you know, sediments coming together and being pressed together and almost glued together. And we've actually estimated by looking at this stuff that the, uh, this, there are rivers on Mars at one time had the flow of 10,000 Mississippi rivers. This is absolutely fascinating. And I, I am not a geologist, but I know a sedimentary rock when I see one. And um, the soil, even on Mars today, as it's a dry and arid surface, there's, there is some frozen water up at the poles. But um, if you were to take a, a cubic foot of water, of, of a soil, and remove the water, you would be able to get two pints of water out of just a cubic foot of Martian soil. Leaving Mars, this is a minor planet series, which is between Mars and Jupiter. We've, we have a probe there right now called Dawn. You can see these bright spots, which we still don't know what they are. There's been a lot of conjecture about water being here as well, either in ice or liquid form under the crust. This is an image from just this year. Anyone know what, where this picture was taken? Pardon me? It's, this is a surface of a comet. Uh, the European Space Agency landed a probe on the surface of 67P and also has the Rosetta probe going around it and taking pictures because of the importance that comets might have played in the ability for life to form in our solar system. And this is the outside of that comet. We haven't heard from the lander in a while. Here's Jupiter. I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about Jupiter. It's not interesting to me because it doesn't have a terrestrial surface, and you guys are all interested in uh, places that have a terrestrial surface, but uh, you can see the, the northern lights here and the southern lights, depending on which way is north, but because of the strong magnetic field, Jupiter does have 63 moons, and some of those moons are very interesting to us. This one, Io. Um, we sent the Galileo probe. That's volcanic activity. As far as we know, this moon and Venus and Earth are the only three places in the solar system that have active volcanoes with flowing lava.
This is probably the next destination we're going to go to. This is Europa. Um, there's discussion right now about sending a probe here. Scientists see these fissures here as evidence of a, a giant kind of ice shell with cracks in it. And because of the gigantic, uh, Jupiter is so huge, as is Saturn, they have a huge gravitational pull. And they are actually pulling on these moons so, so much that it keeps the internal part of the, of the moon warm. And so scientists are pretty well convinced that underneath of this, this thin shell of ice is liquid water, either fresh or salt water. And uh, so we're really interested in getting a probe there to take a look. Saturn, again, huge magnetic field with an aurora. I'm not really interested in Saturn. But we have a Cassini probe there. Still, to this day, this little dot here, were you guys waving when they took the picture? Because that is Earth. But we are interested in Titan. In fact, we were so interested in Titan that we landed a probe on it a few years ago. Um, it's the only moon with a dense atmosphere, and like Earth, it's mostly made of nitrogen. But what's really fascinating about Titan, it's the only other terrestrial body in our solar system that has a liquid that flows on it. It has, it has seas, it has rivers, and it has lakes. And instead of having a water, though, it's mostly made of hydrocarbons like ethane and methane. And it has a, doesn't have a hydrologic cycle, but it rains on the surface of the planet, either liquid methane or ethane. And you can clearly see here some of the, the, the river valleys and some of the small seas and almost some inlets on larger seas. And these are the lakes I was talking about. And these are actually formed kind of like the same way sinkholes in Florida are formed. This is a picture coming down through the atmosphere and actually landing on the surface of this moon and a picture of the moon itself. Enceladus, this is something that uh, we've just sent Cassini this past year, and this we think is a lot like Europa. Once again, large cracks, a big gravitational pull from Saturn, and probably flowing water underneath. And the evidence we have are these geysers. So we think these seas could be uh, you know, maybe miles deep. Uranus and Neptune I'm not too uh, worried about right now because we haven't had a probe there in a long time. But we have had, as I told you, this could be operation. There we go. We do have a probe that just did a flyby of Pluto, which has been absolutely fat. That's uh, Charon, the moon of Pluto going around. It's a binary system, almost like Earth-Moon. And this amazing flyby, and this isn't computer generated. This is all actual photographs you can actually see. You could see the ring of the nitrogen atmosphere around Pluto. Um, Pluto is one of four bodies that has a heavy nitrogen atmosphere like Earth. And an absolutely fascinating surface with mountains and ice flows. And you can actually see the, uh, the atmosphere. Um, there was a picture that was just released today that I didn't have time to get in the slideshow. But uh, just a fascinating place. And the really cool thing is that this probe is now heading out to the Kuiper belt and the Kuiper Belt is kind of that spa space beyond the planets where we think comets formed, and maybe that is where this, the source of the, this prebiotic chemicals that came to Earth. So that takes us back to um, really uh, when you look at all those pictures, it takes you back to back to Eden. Uh, we live in a the, the crown jewel of the, the solar system uh, from an from a aesthetic standpoint and certainly from our ability to, to live on. It's the only place that really could sustain life at this point in time as we know it. It is entirely possible we will find microbes on Mars. I think it's more likely we might find evidence of past microbes on Mars. And this International Space Station, which is our farthest outpost in space, um, staffed by an international crew, which has been up there for over 11 years and counting. Discovery long oh, I, got a, I got ahead of myself again. Go ahead for discovery. Okay, Bruce, well, you had a little bit of a I don't wait, know why I have so audio here. I'll just make the payoff that much sweeter. Thanks for the work, Mike. We'll see you in a couple of weeks. Take care, and uh, let's go ahead and fire up the zone for you. 
and discovery. Close and lock devices and initiate O2 flow. Well, the audio is not cooperating right here. But this is actually getting ready to head on to the rocket that's going to carry us up to the International Space Station. Four, three, two. You can tell one. these two guys here aren't that bright. Because they are they are just about to get onto a controlled explosion and go from sea level to go on 17 sitting stationary at sea level to traveling over 17,000 miles an hour in a little over eight and a half minutes. I think this is hung up. Not responding, beautiful. Main engine cutoff is confirmed. Discovery, Houston. Not Microsoft thinks of everything. Let me try this. It's clearly hung up. There we go. I think it's going to let me now. I think I got to get to where I went. Yeah, I think I got it. Thanks. I actually brought my computer with me for this very thing because NASA, that's uh, we're all about redundancy. All right. I've already explained about these two dummies and about what they're getting ready to go do. Discovery long director. And I'm going to go past the video unless you want to watch Short this because we've, we've seen the audio. Okay, Brew, well, you have a little bit of a wait, but uh, I'll just make the payoff. So. Off we go to the International Space Station. This was, without a doubt, the strangest day of my life. Um, we'd been working a long time to get there. I'd been in training for about two years, uh, just in generic training, to be qualified to go do this. Uh, I was selected for a mission after about three years being down in Houston, and it took about another year and a half of training with an assigned crew uh, to get to this day. But it's a very strange feeling to be leaving your home planet. Um, I remember sitting on the beach that night down at the beautiful, the beautiful beach down at Kennedy Space Center, and uh, the unbelievable moon and stars over the water and a, a nice waves breaking and I'm sitting here thinking, you really want to leave this? But it was absolutely a phenomenal experience. Um, I'm right up there somewhere. I'm not quite sure what I was doing at this time. Probably screaming for my mother. But when we got up to orbit, one of my first jobs was to, there's a hatch downstairs which had a, um, a, a small window. And that window had not had a UV filter put in it. And the first few folks who flew on the space shuttle, whenever they happened to be in front of that window, with it open, with the window cover open, would end up with a fierce sunburn. So my first job was, after a bunch of other things, was to open that little window and put a, a UV filter on it. And we had launched into night, so I hadn't had a chance to look out the window yet, so that was the first time I realized it was day. And to be taken in by this color of blue, which is just absolutely brilliant compared to the, the darkness of space, is just absolutely overwhelming. A few days later, I got to go out for, on a couple of spacewalks, uh, spend about six and a half hours out uh, helping build the International Space Station. This was a photo of the day for NASA. It's the only one I've ever been in. Uh, rightfully so, and even more importantly, um, since it's one I was in, they made sure my gold visor was covering my face. <laughs> but the, uh, the purpose here of this picture is uh, not to show you uh, how beautiful a spacesuit is, but this is the view you have in your visor while you're out there in the world's smallest spaceship with the Earth passing beneath your feet. Um, and as you can imagine, um, we're really busy out there working. Uh, this is me hanging upside down, although you really don't know that you're upside down. Um, because every time the sun came up, which was you know, 16 sunrises and 16 sunsets a day, so over the course of six hours, you would see you know, six, seven sunsets, sunrises. 
and it was really hard not to get distracted and wonder where you were over the earth. What am I flying over? Where, where, where am I right now? Um, or just to stop and gaze and, and take in the beauty of, of our atmosphere or the, or the planetary surface. Uh, this is another one where I was caught slacking on the government dime. Uh, and I remember this specifically, uh, the amazing thunderstorms that you would see built up during the day. Something like this. And the last bit on my last spacewalk, and I just found this picture. And I'll never forget, I was, I was waiting for my, uh, my, my crewmate, my buddy, to get inside because I was the last guy to go in and close the hatch. And so I'm kind of hanging there, and we're just at sunrise, and I just remember seeing these big, massive ice flows, and I kind of had an idea of where we were, because I recognized the geography, because your scale, it's really easy to recognize some places where you are, like New Zealand's really easy to recognize, because it's about the right size, where it looks like it does on the map. Well, this is actually the Gulf of St. Lawrence. Uh, Newfoundland is down here, um, and uh, Quebec is going to be up here. And it was, I'll just never forget, I was out of my last spacewalk, I'm sitting there hanging, the sun's going down, and just having this amazing winter scene below my feet. And when you get back inside, uh, you, you, you didn't spend a lot of time taking photo photography lessons. Well, we took a lot of time to learn how to do it, but that doesn't mean we really studied all that hard until we got there, because we had a lot of other things on our mind, and it's hard to get, comprehend what you're going to want to take pictures of. This place should look familiar to you. You can actually see, you know, kind of the earth in action here. And the Chesapeake Bay. And the Potomac River. And the formation of dunes. This is over uh, Morocco and uh, Algeria, giving a hint of the dynamic atmosphere and the wind, how it shapes our planet. Windrows from sea breeze. Uh, this is off Sicily. Uh, and I, know, remember, I remember like yesterday taking this picture. Because it almost looks like a volcano erupt in here. This picture, for the folks who spend time planting trees, which is all of you, this, is, you, this should be your reward. Because in my view, this is a picture of our planet breathing. Um, anyone guess where this is? It's the Amazon Delta. And wherever there's vegetation, there's clouds starting to form. And I get asked a lot, well, what, is a, what does a tropical rainforest look like from the International Space Station, from the space shuttle? I said, yeah, it looks like clouds. <laughs> and, and at night, it looks like lightning. But this is one of those days where it's just an amazing, amazing image. And you can also, of course, see all the sediment runoff heading out to the Atlantic. The biological processes that form land. Uh, in the Bahamas, as coral reefs work and shape the surface. Subtle indications of volcanism. This is Crater Lake in Wizard Island. And the not so subtle evidence of volcanism. Uh, this is the Kuril Islands. And you can actually see the shock wave from the power of this explosion and how it cleared off um, the clouds around it. And I know that's a shock wave because this is the same effect the space shuttle would have when it was launching through clouds. We actually had a gentleman take a picture of an active volcano in, um, the, off the coast of Alaska. And uh, the Capcom friend of mine called the US Geologic Survey to find out what was the name of the island where the volcano was erupting. And the U.S. Geologic Survey, first he said they, they thought it was a crank call. So I think he had to call back a sec because, hey, I'm calling from NASA and some guy in space sees a volcano erupting in Alaska. Could you tell me which one it is? Click. <laughs> Calls back again. No, really, this is, I'm calling from NASA and the guy, no, no, there's nothing active going on. You know, there's no active volcanoes. We would know with the U.S. Geologic Survey. And he's like, well, he's looking at it right now. So they actually sent a picture of the U.S. Geologic Survey. And they had almost instant, they, it was faster than their size, uh, seismographs. Rift zones, uh, evidence of plate tectonics, agriculture, the Nile Valley. This is the Sinai Peninsula. The Dead Sea. 
just our atmosphere at work. This was a low pressure system over the North Atlantic that was just hanging there for, for days on end. The not so subtle changes that humans cause <laughs> Dubai. Lake Nasser in Egypt. Suburban desert southwest. Oop. The urbanization along the western shore of uh, Chesapeake Bay of Baltimore. The Mississippi Delta, which is a fascinating place. I fly over to Louisiana all the time. And what's really amazing to me is with the engineering of this river, I don't know if you, any of you read the book Man vs. Nature by John McPhee. It's a fascinating what's going on here to this day, and you can see it in space quite clearly. Um, the Mississippi, all this sediment loads being carried down. You see these villages and towns that are hanging to the side of the river, which is continuously being dredged. And the whole rest of the boot of Mississippi, what it looks like on the map and what we study in schools, it doesn't really look like a boot because of subsidence and sea level rise is flooding most of that area just, just west of where the Mississippi drains into the Gulf of Mexico. This is near Morgan City, Louisiana. And this is back to the Mississippi Delta. And this is the Deepwater Horizon spill. My friend who took this, I remember the day he called down from orbit and he used the words heartbreaking. This is the Aral Sea, which is slowly evaporating. This is also the Caspian Sea, which is also being worked pretty heavily because of oil and natural gas development in Kazakhstan and around and around. Madagascar, where you get a pretty good idea of where their topsoil is going due to deforestation. Make an island in the Kiritiba Atoll, probably some of the most at risk landscapes to sea level rise. Bermuda. Sable Island off Nova Scotia. This is in Patagonia. We've actually, we've had crews up on space long enough to see these glaciers receding and to be able to measure year by year how far back they're retreating. This is another uh, threat from climate change is the destructive storms we're seeing. This is actually Louisiana, New Orleans, Louisiana after Hurricane Katrina. Um, we actually have a NASA facility down, facility down there, which is the green spot. And anything that doesn't look kind of like this or green, all this dark brown is all water. So you can actually see the dividing line where the flooding took place. And this is Superstorm Sandy, which I know people just north of here are very familiar with. So the space shuttle, you know, we go up to construct the space station. We're working there as scientists, but we really also have the pleasure of being um, observers of uh, the remarkable beauty of our planet. This is uh, right along the Orinoco Delta down in Venezuela. And this is on our way to dock to the International Space Station. But I want to show you a few films to hopefully try to transport you there and see what it really looks like. You can see this is actually moon setting over massive thunderstorms. The ridiculously thin atmosphere we have. Here's the top of a thunderstorm, and here's where the sky turns black. I know it's tough, tough with scale. You don't have to be all that far, all that high in the Earth's atmosphere to see the darkness of space. Those thunderstorms might be 50,000 feet. Passing over cities at night, and those little flashes are thunderstorms which will light you up from below, even if you're 200 miles above them. And they'll fill the window, fill the spaceship with light. It's amazing. 
and I'll slow one down here for you and try to give you, tell you where we are. So this is actually coming across, this is London in the English Channel, heading across into France. The, the Mediterranean Sea is down here where it's dark, and basically heading over to Central Europe. You can see the Earth shine up here, again giving indication of the, relative to the diameter of the Earth, how thin the atmosphere is. Coming down, this is actually coming down the coast of California. You'll see San Francisco right here. And come on down further, LA. Baja Peninsula, thunderstorms along, probably near Puerto Vallarta. Over here is going to be uh, the, uh, the Yucatan Peninsula, coming Panama. We cross a, come across the Amazon, how do you know? There's lots of clouds. <laughs> and head on down Tierra del Fuego towards uh, Antarctica and sunrise. Houston, New Orleans, there's Florida there. Coming up your neck of the woods, Jacksonville. And you can see Baltimore and Washington up here, the Outer Banks. Delaware Bay, Long Island, and the Northern Lights. Again, thunderstorms. You see the satellite right there going across? We're flying above them. And Comet Lovejoy, orbital sunrise. And flying through kind of a solar storm. The, the aurora is absolutely magnificent because it phosphoresces different colors depending on what's getting ionized. And you can actually see the different colors in these fingers, some of which look like they're coming higher than you are. And the pink tends to be higher depending on what's being ionized. And at night, really getting a picture of where you are and what you're a part of. And what's really nice of being above the atmosphere is when you're looking out at, at nighttime, you can say, you know what, that star there, it's closer than that star there, which is closer than that star there. That star there. It has a three-dimensional aspect that the atmosphere here just won't allow us. Even the clearest skies on the darkest nights. So here's our International Space Station. This is the thin veil of atmosphere that protects us, uh, along with our magnetic field, and allows something very special to flourish on this magnificent planet, and that's life. Uh, it's a very unique thing. As far as we know, this is all we got. And so it's incumbent upon us, as you know, to take care of it. Flying the space shuttle up above the International Space Station, it just gives you a real feel for this, just this, this beautiful orb and, and, a, and a, just a completely in darkness. We like to say at NASA that we're off the Earth uh, for the Earth. Uh, what we do there helps us understand the processes that shape this planet. That's why we study other planets, um, is to understand the processes that shape this one. We're ultimately up there to do science as well, which we think benefits everyone here on Earth. And I like to say that this is a partnership. I'm really glad NASA is going to be here tomorrow. Um, your role in this is absolutely critical. Um, this mission's for all of us. And uh, your job out there, you know, educating, advocating, and just applying elbow grease to a, a difficult situation, it, we, none of this is going to get done if we're not working together. I'm here for uh, as long as Lou will let me to answer any questions. I really appreciate uh, you guys having me, and I hope uh, you enjoyed some of my, my home movies from a great trip I got to take a few years ago. <laughs> We, we do have time for some questions. Come on down to the microphones on either side. Are you going to announce prizes under their seats? <laughs> <laughs> he said he was giving away cars.
That was so beautiful. Like, I was just so amazed, and I just was saying, ah, like, the whole time. Except um, when my picture was up there, but yeah, I get it. <laughs> um, my question is, how do we get to see stuff like this? I mean, I'm, I feel honored that I was able to be here today to see this beautiful presentation, but just for the everyday folk, how can we be able to see these beautiful things? Um, you mean in film or in person? Well, in film. <laughs> because uh, honestly, the, the first thing you want to do when you get home is when you, when you get up there, you just want the people you know and care about to be there with you to see it. It's, and so it's, it's incumbent upon us, those of us who've been fortunate enough to, to go, to come and tell the story and share it with you guys. Um, but NASA is incredibly good about getting it. You guys own all this. I mean, all these images you guys pay for. And uh, so NASA is really good about making this available. And I, I got some of these off YouTube. That one of the, the, uh, the very last video I showed with the, the, the galaxy all lit up at night, Scott Kelly just took that one about two months ago. Uh, actually, it was less than that. I saw it, I saw it on his Twitter feed. I'm like, holy cow. I'm like you. It was, uh, so I said, well, I'm going to add one, that in my presentation because I did see something like that. I just didn't take the picture because I didn't pay attention in photography class. <laughs> no, I did pay. Don't let my instructor. He'll probably see this. I'm any other questions? But the YouTube channel, NASA's YouTube channel is, is fantastic. I lived in space for a long time and underwater. What's, what you got? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, the, well, the obvious answer is the view, uh, because when you look out your window at night, I saw these big Goliath groupers. I was never alone. Even um, you, you got to know some of the fish that hung around. So if you were getting tired of your crew, you felt like you had other friends there. Um, on the International Space Station, you don't have that option. You're kind of stuck with people. Um, fortunately, I enjoyed the people I was stuck with, and uh, hopefully they felt the same way about me. Um, the, the big difference, uh, there's... The similarity for me was both of them are in rather extreme environments and uh, there, there's consequences for doing things wrong. We were only in 45, 50 feet of water off the coast of Florida, but we were in saturation. So for something was gonna, if you did something that required you to go to the surface, it was gonna take a long time. And if you went up to the surface accidentally, you were gonna end up in a decompression chamber, maybe with the bends or an embolism or worse. So that part was similar. Uh, the differences, um, the International Space Station was a lot way more comfortable. It's maintained at a certain humidity. I was just telling Cindy earlier, um, living underwater with a wet porch in the ocean, you can imagine, you know what it's like when you get, you're at the beach and you can't wait to get a fresh water shower and get out of your bathing suit? Well, you're basically not out of your bathing suit for 10 or 11 days because you're just never getting away. So you just always felt like you were humid and a little bit hot, although they did a pretty good job of maintaining temperature. Um, but that was probably the big difference. I thought the International Space Station was more comfortable that way. Any, did I answer your question or? Okay. Yes. Sure, yeah. Um, Ricky, repeat that. Yeah, what was the difference? What was the, your readjusting from coming back from living underwater to land? In space, I'm sorry, yeah. Uh, so coming back, my first memory coming back from and getting, making the surface and getting into the boat was just the smell of Florida, um, which was also similar to, uh, to the uh, coming back from the International Space Station. Uh, you just, you know, it smells pretty good. Uh, the Earth has a very, is very fragrant. Um, the, physiologically, though, coming back, we went through decompression, and it took almost you know, all night, because they had to basically raise us up to sur the surface level. We'd been underwater for so long, and had to get all the, the nitrogen out of our blood. Um, but coming out, as soon as I got out of the water, I was hungry, I was ready to eat, I was ready to go. I mean, I didn't feel any different. When, I, when we landed um, on the space shuttle, I was completely out of my mind dizzy. Um, I felt like my head was spinning on its axis going 17,000 miles an hour. I remember trying to walk off of it, 
and I was like one of those kids who did the broom race and spun around. And I know I was walking uh, at a, a, probably at a 45 degree angle, listing like this, and it's a good thing they had guardrails. So it took me a little bit longer to acclimate and feel hungry again. Um, hours, but I remember as soon as we got off and I was done with the doctors from the Nemo mission living underwater, I was up at a Thai restaurant getting something to eat and I felt fine. That wasn't the case coming back from space. Some people, it's just, it affects people differently coming back from space. Some people have a, they tend to be, uh, it, it, getting up to orbit is also kind of disruptive to your inner ear. And some people have more trouble with that. I didn't feel great when I got to orbit, but I was able to eat. Um, when I came down, it took a few hours before I really wanted to hazard eating anything. Yes, ma'am. Hold up a sec. Hold up. experiences so did you have any spiritual experience I get this asked this question a lot you think I'd come up with a good answer at some point um, not so much in the ocean I was really excited to be there since that's what I studied in college and uh, in, in graduate school so I kind of felt like boy did I really go a long way to go do something that I started off trying to do when I was 20 years old a rather circuitous route um, it was incredibly beautiful. I remember doing a night dive, which was really special. Um, on, but it wasn't with, outside of my realm of experience. I'd done scuba diving before, so that part was very familiar. So I was excited to be there, but it was within my experience base. Um, being on orbit was not within my experience base. And, and you don't know how to, how to prepare yourself for that emotionally. You know how to prepare to do the mission, but emotionally. Um, and I do remember, particularly on one spacewalk, and I'm not one to prone to tears, and I didn't start crying, but I remember a lot, standing there on the edge of the space station, just holding on, and I had a few minutes in between things, and the earth passing by, and I just remember thinking, like, A, I, maybe, maybe spiritual is maybe not the right answer, but you know, how, did, how did I get away with this? <laughs> and, you know, that I actually got selected to be here and get to do something like that. And then it also, that, when you ask that question of yourself, it, get, it triggers other larger questions. So, yes, but um, that's one of those things I still have to ponder. Yeah. You guys are killing me. Yeah, I'm gonna go over here next. How is the uh, selection, you said the selection, you got selected. I understand the selection process is pretty hard. How did you get selected? <laughs> Everyone Amen. who knows me asks the same question. <laughs> you can fool some of the people some of the time. No, uh, the, the selection process is pretty rigorous. Uh, the, the basic requirement is a degree in science, technology, in STEM, basically, mathematics, engineering. Now, that's the basic requirement. They like people who have aviation backgrounds. They like people who have operational backgrounds. They like advanced degrees. Um, I applied and you know, filled out the standard SF-171, whatever the federal employment form was. You know, they put out a call. You go to USA Jobs, send the thing in. <laughs> I am not making this up. <laughs> and uh, you, I, I heard from them saying, I got an email saying, hey, we need you to go get a flight physical. Like, okay, so I tried to get that. And they said, oh, never mind, we want to interview you. So I have the, there's thousands of applicants. And then they actually sort through those piles, and I was actually part of the most recent selection, so I know how this happens. And you try to determine who's highly qualified um, and who probably needs some more seasoning. And they also try to identify skill sets that they feel that they need to cover all of our responsibilities. So if we happen to have like a whole bunch of doctors and none of them have left and we still have a bunch of doctors, we might not pick a doctor that time. Same with like maybe a military pilot. So they establish these piles based on highly qualified, uh, and then they call you in for an interview. Well, they told me it was an interview. Um, it's an hour-long interview. I was there for an entire week. Now it's actually two trips. One's a week, and one's a little bit shorter than that. And the rest of it's basically doctors. So you got 100 and some people there, all between the age of 35 to 48 or 50. The doctors are going to be able to find something wrong with half of them right off the bat. And it's usually stuff you could live to be 150 with. But, you know, eyesight, hearing, you might have a thyroid problem when you turn 90, you know, that kind of stuff. Um, and so then it gets down to the, you know, about half, probably about 50% failure rate on medical stuff. 
and then they select the number they feel they need to, to do the job for the next two to four to six years. So, um, yeah, the interview was a, you know, really simple. Tell us about your life since high school for an hour with a guy who walked on the moon at the table. <laughs> so it was probably one, that was probably one of the second strangest moments of my life. Yes, sir. So uh, what practical jokes do they play on rookies on space missions? We had a few rookies. So I think the practical joke was they made us fly together. Um, <laughs> no, you know, uh, it was, I was really fortunate um, that uh, the guys I flew with who were experienced were interested in, in sharing as much as they could with us and setting us up for success. It was a real a testimony to leadership. And we got a lot of leaders in this room. Like my commander, John Phillips, who was, I don't think I had a picture of John up there, but it was his third mission. And Koichi Wakata, who was a Japanese astronaut, he was on his way to the International Space Station. Their form of leadership was to make the guys who, this was their first time, set them up as much as possible for success and give them all the credit and take all the hardship on them. So those guys were absolutely phenomenal. We had a lot of fun. We told a lot of jokes, um, particularly losing stuff on orbit's really easy. You know, you can't just sit this cup down. You sit it anywhere, it's gone, because it's gonna float away, and any gust of breeze or whatever from the ventilation system, it's gonna be gone. We made fun of each other a lot about that and other things, but uh, no hazing. I didn't have to wear a costume or anything. But yeah, they were great leaders, and you know, they, they're, they're, he, uh, my commander, he said, my number one job is to make you the absolute best you can be. And so when the boss comes and wants to select someone else for a mission, they know you can do the job. You had talked about a couple of probes that had either been recently launched or were going to be launched shortly to some of those moons. Can you give us any idea about the time frame it'll take them to reach those places or when we could expect to hear back, maybe? The, that's a great question. I know we're talking 2020 for the next Mars rover. But a lot of this, um, the, 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 the probe that is going to go to Europa, which is really interesting, there's a congressman, I think it's John Culp, I, I don't want to say the wrong con congressional name from Texas, that would look bad. There's a, new, a congressman from Texas who's now on the science committee who is incredibly interested in that mission. And this, a lot of that stuff is just dependent upon Congress. The stuff has to get baselined and funded, just like all your projects. And, um, and if you have budgetary issues, then they got to be continuing to willing to fund it. The next big one, I would say, would uh, Mars, and getting to Mars is a nine-month endeavor, depending on how they want to get there, uh, looking at a 2020 time frame. And what's going to be really cool there is they're going to see if they can actually manufacture water out of, or manufacture oxygen out of the existing materials they can find on Mars to posture ourselves for prep, potentially future human missions. So 2020 time frame for the Mars. Europa, that depends on when Congress will fund it. But I have a feeling that's going to be the, 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 the next big one we, we go to. We'll continue going to Mars. There's 12 active, no, seven active probes on Mars right now. Even India has a probe orbiting Mars right now. Uh, yes, sir. How you doing? Great. How are you? We all share this common interest or sentiment for our environment. Um, and not all youth share such a sentiment. Um, what do you think are some ideas for getting youth to become more environmentally conscious um, in your eyes? Education, education, education. I, I, you know, I don't, it starts at home and it's carried on beyond that. Um, uh, we live in a culture um, that is, uh, heavily geared toward extraction and consumerism. And, uh, and that's a challenge, I think, even for highly educated kids, um, the kids who get to go to good schools and hear this message. Um, I, I, I'm speaking as a parent now, and uh, it's, a, it's a challenge to make people understand. It's a challenge to make adults and leadership understand that things aren't inexhaustible, right? So it's education, education, education. It's a simple answer, but um, it's a long process. Um, yes, when in looking at your picture, the Earth looks is so beautiful and looks so fragile, and um, it seems as if a lot of the people in Congress now don't seem to feel the same way. That is a fragile.
planet that's something uh, in danger. And I, I just wondering if, you know, NASA's, you know, this show ought to be seen by everybody in Congress, that sort of stuff. Um, yes, uh, I would agree. Um, the, uh, the challenge with, with, the challenge with that, the way our system is operating, at least in my opinion, this is just me speaking, is um, con con I'm not convinced congressmen are always articulating what they really believe. Um, so I'm not convinced that all the folks in Congress don't understand that the planet is incredibly fragile, but I don't, I'm not convinced those people who know it are all articulating it. And, uh, and part of that is, I think, in educating the population around, I mean, our leaders are only as good as, the, our elected officials are only as good as the people who vote for them, right? And they have to, they gotta get, they, they wanna get reelected, and um, so our job is to educate the populace so they're asking the right questions. It's a challenge. Yes, ma'am. Uh, I'm also curious about what kind of psychological screening there was. I can only imagine. Lou would like, swear not enough. What is that? <laughs> like anxiety or, um, you know, somebody quick to temper or how much flexibility you have kind of a thing. Because, man, there's close quarters. And if, you know, you got a hothead up there. <laughs> yeah, the, uh, we do go through screening. Uh, mine, because I was screen, my initial screen on my, part of this is you spend time with a, a, a psychiatrist and a psychologist, right? They take, you go take all these tests and they're looking for contradictions in your answers. Yeah. And then they start poking at stuff that they see in the answers. And you're sitting there asking, okay, how am I supposed to answer this so he doesn't ask any questions? I mean, so you got to sit down and have an interview every year on your, my birthday, one of my presents from the United States government and NASA is I get to sit down with my friend, Dr. Bevins, and talk about my life. And um, he's a great guy. And uh, the, uh, but you're right, it's, it's absolutely critical. And with, for long duration missions, it's even more critical. So we actually do more psychological screening, team building activities as part of the, uh, as part of the selection process, see how people work and play together. That's probably the most critical thing when you're going to interview f for this job, you've already been selected as highly qualified. Then it, I think 90% of what the panel's looking for is can I stand being in a school bus with this person for X number of days? And, uh, and it's a, a challenge. And once you get there, you, we also send you to things like Nemo to go live underwater and to train you the good expeditionary behavior. That's one of our things we study a lot is expeditionary behavior. You know, what are your expectations as being part of an expedition? You know, self-care, uh, self self-management, good leadership, good followership, being able to be a, le a strong leader and transition into a strong follower, sometimes during the same task. Um, those are all things that we continually instill in people. It's just something you have to develop, develop in people. Yeah, yeah the, um, even though it looked like a great vacation, obviously there's a lot of work that gets done up there. Oh yeah. Uh, uh, on the space station. And I'm just curious if you, what are some of the really exciting things that are kind of being done, the science that's being done that may actually relate to the environment and uh, our care of it? Yeah, so um, great question. You're right, most of those pictures I took were taken on the last day uh, because I didn't have time to take any pictures the first 11 days of the mission because I didn't have time to look out. The, I mean, you look out the window, oh, that's really cool. I got to get this done. Um, and I wasn't, uh, a, a, I was basically up there as, as part of the construction crew. Um, and we were able to provide power to get more science done on the International Space Station. So there's a lot of stuff going on. Um, environmentally, that's a great question. I think the number one thing we're doing for envir the, the environment here on Earth is driving technology. We have a closed loop system in the International Space Station, largely closed loop. We process, 93% of our water is reprocessed. We reprocess urine, perspiration. Any, any liquid up there is getting processed back into drinking water. You know, we're drinking tomorrow's coffee today, I think is the saying. Um, <laughs> atmospheric revitalization. Um, we, we, I think just that, that analog and this is another thing, getting people to understand that Earth is a closed loop system. Intellectually, they can look at the International Space Station and say, oh yeah, I get that's a closed loop system. We're largely, we have to fly some water and we have to fly some materials up to make it happen. Um, 
But they get that intellectually. I was like, well, what's so different about here? So I think the number one thing we're doing is uh, for, for the environment up there, other than you know, remote sensing, uh, public, uh, you know, explain to the public things we've seen. Uh, we do have uh, uh, the alpha magnetic spectrometer, which is helping us understand how the universe was formed, answering some larger questions about how the Earth got here. But I think the number one thing is just this uh, driving technology for, um, for water recycling and water for pur purification, because that technology is going to be used here in the United States sooner than anyone wants to admit. California is going to be cranking open desal plants. And we're going to have to, that technology's got to get better because it's hugely energy intensive. And I, I think that's one of the most important ones. Yes, sir. That's a great question. Oh, oh that side, sorry. Well, it's sort of a follow up to Al's because um, you mentioned that NASA goes, leaves Earth for Earth, right? And so what sort of information have you gathered from other planets or other moons that we can apply or that you feel like could be applied to Earth, specifically conservation, if you can think of anything? Large questions. Where did life come from? How did it get here? Why is Earth so special? I mean, that's, a, that's, that's the thing that drives drove the environmental movement, right? And that's why we're all here. We understand how precious it is. Um, why did Mars have an atmosphere and flowing water? Why does it not anymore? What happened to Venus's? Why does it, Venus not car cycle carbon? And why does its atmosphere 97%? And look what the greenhouse effect is like there. Uh, if there was life on Mars, where'd it go? What happened? I think those larger systems, we have one system, it's a complex system, but the Earth is one system. And I think having a larger n than one when trying to understand how these complex systems work is uh, incredibly helpful to people trying to figure out what's happening here on earth I i'm fascinated by mars um and we're learning more because because of the number of probes there I, I frankly i would not be surprised if at some point they said hey yeah we've we've found some evidence of microbial life or past microbial life well why didn't it take root they're kind of fundamental questions but they're big picture questions Yes, sir. What is, what is the current thinking among the odds makers at NASA about the likelihood of finding some kind of life on the moons of Saturn and Jupiter, given that there's, they've now discovered these oceans that may be liquid under the surface? It's, uh, I think it's compelling enough to want to build probes and spend time going and looking. And what was really fascinating to me is uh, the Galileo probe. Once we figured out that maybe there's water on Europa, Galileo, we were just going to let it run out of power. Uh, we actually put it on a trajectory to crash it into Jupiter because they were scared of Galileo just kind of tumbling around around Jupiter and maybe crashing into Europa and contaminating the planet with microbes from Earth. Microbes from Earth. Um, when I was out doing my spacewalk, they took samples off my glove, and there were microbes that were still able to survive. So uh, that, to me, is pretty compelling that someone was saying, you know, we could, we could really screw this place up. It's kind of ironic what we're doing here. But, uh, <laughs> but uh, that we went to the trouble to crash a probe into Jupiter rather than possibly let it fly into another planet and contaminate it. So I think people find the, 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 the evidence compelling. Yes, sir. Uh, what was uh, daily life up there floating around in microgravity? It took a little bit of getting used to. It took a while to learn how to sleep. It was a lot of fun, um, you know, floating around back and forth. It took a while to get used to not wanting to be heads up all the time. About a three days before you kind of, kind of felt comfortable uh, tilting your head in the other direction without worrying about maybe getting sick. But once you got used to it, it was absolutely phenomenal um, and uh, it, it, a lot of fun. Um, that's when you see all the pictures of us playing. It's just, a, it's just a very joyful experience. It's challenging on the human body. Uh, we've had, uh, we have bone loss. We have muscle loss. We have uh, uh, eye issues where we have folks coming back farsighted. 
There's, uh, we're exposed to radiation at night uh, because we're, although we're protected by the magnetic sphere, we're pretty high up in the atmosphere. And the first night I went to sleep, I could see my retinas lighting up from subatomic particles from the sun passing through them. I could just see these little flashes. No one told me about that beforehand. I saw a thing on TV about three years after I got back, Mike Fole talking about it. I mean, why didn't you tell me that? <laughs> so, um, However, we've been able to mitigate a lot of that stuff with exercise and, and diet, at least from the bone loss and muscle loss, people are coming back pretty healthy, but we still have some issues with what's going on with our eyes. Um, and radiation is always gonna be a, a challenge until we figure a way to make something light that can repel radiation. Movie makers just wave a wand and make it happen, but we need to figure that one out. All right, I think we've, we've had enough, Richard. I warned thank you out, huh? <laughs> thank you very much, appreciate it. It's, uh, it's absolutely my pleasure, my pleasure to be here, and I'm around, and if you see me, I, and I, I won't be running around in my pajamas all night, but uh, if, you, if you do see me, please feel free to come up and ask questions, and I mean, that's what I'm here for, and I'm more than happy to share. Like I said, uh, this, is, this is something our country has decided to do, and, uh, and, and you guys decided it was important enough that we do it. And I'm really happy to be come back and come back and share some of my story with you and, and talk to you later as well. So thanks so much. And again, thank you for all, all that you do um, each and every day. It's very much appreciated. Thanks. Um, so it's time to go. Um, Nine o'clock here tomorrow. Ask him how his per diem went when he was in space. It was fun. Good night, gang. Science was pretty good. Up until the end. Up until the end. Up until, and you'll know exactly what yeah, I'm talking right. about. At the end, where they had the dramatic rescue, they're oh, kind of yeah, like right. poking holes in their spacesuit oh, yeah, and everything. Sure, it was, yeah. oh, okay, yeah, but 